the meditation. And since we're doing the um, the verses from the Bhagavad Gita, as we usually do, we'll work the work the teachings of the Idam Shadidam. We did this kind of a little bit back when we were doing the Mandukya, but in the context of studying the verse, it becomes very different. And so we see how the Nidhi Dhyasana, the meditation style that's specifically linked to contemplating on the teachings, is with the teachings, or not somehow a separate meditation practice and teachings practice. Shri Ganeshaya Namaha Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha the day settle by letting the body relax. Conscious of places in the body, places in this body, vidam sharidam, this body of which I am aware of now through sense perception. What is calling you is a sense of touch. Hearing. Where can you bring the touch of breath to where the body needs the touch of breath to relax? Conscious of the contact with the earth, sensation now, any pressure, textures, just to receive awareness of this body through any of the five senses you are now noticing. Now in your mind there is a location in the body and there is a sense organ associated with it. Meaning allow yourself to be aware of a part of the body and in what sense, which of the five senses <clears throat> is illuminating this part of the body now. Explore more and more of what that particular sense continues to reveal under your illumination. This is not speculative, this is not visualizing unless that was a sense, but being in that sensation now, sensation awareness is <clears throat> sensatious awareness is look now I am aware of the sensation is that not true in your experience right now? Can you say, I am aware of this sensation? Is 
Does that feel accurate to your direct experience right now? As you illumine this part of the body with that sense organ. If I am aware of this sensation, there is subject-object, kshetra, kshetranya relationship now with this body, idam shridam. To say me is inaccurate or my body is inaccurate. Recognize I am the one aware of this body through sensation. Objects of perception, known, known to me. The kshitranya, aware of this field, the kshitra, that is the body, idam sharidam. This body, not me, not mine is accurate, is my direct experience now. Explore. Am I not aware of this body? As objects of sense perception. Who then is the eye that illumines? That is me. Say me. When you say me, all those attributes that evoke your most personal me is the one that illumines. Idam Sharidam, this body. If I feel a sense of touch, legs, feet on the support, blanket, earth, chair, I'm aware of my feet crossing where the ankles cross. That pressure is illumined in me. Every sense or experience recognized, illumines, is illumined by you. You're noticing. And when your noticing is drawn now, say you have an itch on the knee. The itch is illumined in me. In my conscious presence, I'm aware of sense object. So the mind moves. What is illumined shifts. But it is always me aware of the shifting. Now, Dham Sharidam, this body. Sharidam is an assembly of parts. There's many ways we can explore the glory of the order and life and Vitality of this body, idam sharidam. Five elements, the panchabhuta, are in this body. The five elements, the panchabhuta, are in all creation. Aware now of the legs, shins, thighs, calf muscles. The legs are very solid, there is liquid. 
for the most part, and also because whether you're sitting on a chair or the floor, the feet or the sitting bones, this lower part is connecting you to the earth. Prittivi. earth element, really more a sense of matter, material, substance. Om And higher up in the body, in the intestines now, in the bladder, what is your awareness, the sensation of space? bladder, intestines, look at all they do, such order, such tapaha, perseverance to continue. There's water in the bladder and the intestines, apaya, apa, in constant exchange with the water outside this body. Is the water that runs through my veins, the lymph, constant exchange with the streams outside this body in the five elements world without? Where is the boundary of my water and the water in exchange with the rest of creation? Where in this body is this water mine when it is in constant exchange? Its very essence is its own, I do nothing. Feel now, watch now the water in your body, recognizing the constant exchange with the water outside. Where is the boundary? Body, kshetra, the field known, object known. River, kshetra, the field, object known sense perception, where is the boundary? Know the water in your body, Abba. Dham Shadidam, so many elements that play in order in my awareness. I watch the order of the body unfolding now, not speculative. You are here, body is here. The stomach, the fire, the digestion, Agni, consuming matter to energy. That same fire throughout the world, constant exchange. Acknowledge that vitality, that digestive fire. And acknowledge that energy, that fire, and so many other places in creation, all the way to the sun. Agni, Surya. Where's the boundary? Know that fire in your body. What does it need? When does it overcook? When does it move into scattered fire places in the body that 
doesn't fall off. I can use digestive, I can scatter thoughts. To name it is to know it in your body. Be done, shut it on. body to the rib cavity, to the lungs, <clears throat> you have the air, the prana, the vayu, the five vayus in the body, amazing relationships and interplay which we will explore over time. And those pranas also manifest all throughout nature as you feel air coming in the mouth and the esophagus, where is the boundary? My air and the air around me. Dham Shadidam, how much is this in mind now? You see, it's all parts made up and drawn from the world around me and all objects of my perception. Aware of this body I am, side by side with the five elements in nature, both equally illumined in my conscious presence. Dham Shadidam, revealing I, the knower, Kshitvanya of the field, Kshitva, the body and the manifest creation share that same relationship as field in my perception, not me. And that air that comes in, the Vayu, is in constant exchange with that so-called external, outside the body. Where is the boundary? A beautiful example of the no boundaryness. The air is in and out. Where is it mine? Where is it not? That constant exchange, touching every cell in this body that breath does. Is it my air? Is it me? Idam Shadidam Gantaya Kshetram Tyabadiyate. Aware of this body I am. Aware of the world's five senses I am. Om Vayade. Vayu, the wind, the breath, the prana, the vitality of life, Hidya Nagarva. Om Mayave Namaha. Om Mayave Namaha. esophagus, the voice box, the cranium, the mouth, the sinuses, the ears, space, Akash. Akasha, space, allows the sound of this voice to travel to your ears, the outer ear, Space. In your ear, space. To drum, space. To nerve signal, sound comes. There is a boundary in the space from the inner ear to the outside world that brought the sound. 
Where is the boundary, the dimension, the limited size of the space from the sinuses to the inner ears out into the world? Where does my space begin and end? Space that holds the whole body, that holds this room, that fills this room. Prakasha. That holds all. Om Akashaya Namaha. Know that space in your body. Feel the spaciousness from within. Om Akashaya Namaha. What a role it plays if we're not that space in the body. Each five elements has their role, their order, they continue. What do you do? They continue. I watch. Om Shanti 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 Take your time moving as you wish. Yeah, the um can you give me the white and blue binders, please? Yes. The Pudamida Mantra? Or the the Sahanava too rather. Mm -hmm. Anybody know how to We do a call response anyway, you got it, right? I know it. You know? It? You gonna leave it today? No. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Uh, okay. So this is an invocation we start uh, the teaching with. And um, it's Swami Dayananda starts every class with this as well, as many of the sadhus and many lineages. And I'll post it shortly so we have the translation. It's about the teacher-student interaction. It's a beautiful verse. Setting the tone for the, the study. Om Sahana Bhavatu. Om Sahana Bhavatu. Sahana Bunatu Sahana Bunatu Sahaviryam Sahaviryam Karavavahai Karavavahai Tejaspina Tejaspina Vati Tamastu Vati Tamastu Ma Vidvisha Bahai E Ma Vidvisha Bahai Om Shanti 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 Hi. Om Shanti 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 Hi. So today we continue with the 13th chapter of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, verse 1, which talks about the Kshetra and the Kshetranya, meaning knower and knower. And it brings us into what we call a key a teaching methodology, the subject-object teaching. There's a verse then, the Dirik Drishya Viveka, which for 40 verses, I should say, a piece goes into specifically this whole subject-object unpacking. And I want to look at the first verse, which we did kind of in the Mandukya session. It's worth spending time over and over again. There's layers and layers, and particularly then the context of the conversation that comes up with um, Arjuna and Krishna about Kshetra and Kshetranya becomes informed differently. I'll, I'll also bring in more 
the Asti Bhati Priyam verse, which comes later, verse 20. There's an article on my website that explains that for us. So we already have resources to unfold it. So we can really spend some time with these concepts. It's good. This might teach you that Swami Dayananda has trained a lot of people. I work with a woman in Berkeley who he's worked with. We spent from... I didn't come in at the beginning of the Digdisha, but I went back and listened to it. But it was easily August to May or June, these 40 verses, weekly. So one verse we could spend several weeks talking about. This is how the system is. Because I'm not just here to translate it and speak it to you, but to see how is it engaging in your life? How is it landing? Oh, it's not, oh, we've heard these vocabulary words before. Thus, we shouldn't go over them again. That exploring the actual meaning of the principle will land on me differently now after I've contemplated for a week. And having the same lesson again will actually have a really different effect after a meditation like that. And you say you meditated all week. You know, you know what I mean? So in the tradition, we keep coming back. As Swamiji says, there's only one lesson. <laughs> so we'll chant the verse. Bhagavad Gita 13.1. And again, it starts, important to realize this is a dialogue between Krishna and Juna. So the verse starts, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Uvacha is speaks. It's nice to bring that in. I sort of start to see it like now we're, we're eavesdropping. We're stepping into the dialogue. And joining these two amazing characters and hearing what they have to say. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Since you guys don't have the writing in front of you, do hear, listen for the long A sounds. In the text that we'll give you, they have the line over the A. That means it's actually two meters. It's, it's time, not just fullness. It hangs longer. It's, 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 does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'll try to do my best to do it. I'm practicing and learning. My errors are mine. Whatever I've been able to learn, I thank my teachers for it immensely daily. So I'm going to exaggerate the long eyes so you can hear them. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. And cha is a short eye. That's an A too. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Idam Shariram Kanteya. Idam Shariram Kanteya. Kshetram. Kshetram. Itya Bidiyate. The E has the same phenomenon. Etadio veti. Etadio veti. Tam prauhu. Pram prauhu. Tam. Tam. Prauhu. Prauhu. Tam. Tam. Prauhu. Prauhu. Shetranya. Shetranya. Che. Che. Let's just do chetra. 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 Chetram. Chetram. Chetranya. Chetranya. That's got some of the most like gnarly Sanskrit compound letters you could have, both in one word. <laughs> the <laughs> nya and the ch. Yeah. That's probably why writing them are confusing. Good. Chetranya iti. Chetranya iti. Chetranya iti. <laughs> Since I don't get to do often much with you guys anymore, I feel like Sanskrit's Padmasana for the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the rhythm, the Vedic meter that I try to learn. Idam Shariram Kanteya. Idam Shariram Kanteya. Chetram itya bidiyate. Chetram itya bidiyate. Itadyo veti. Itadyo veti. Tam pra uhu. Tam pra uhu. Chetranya iti. Chetranya iti. Tad vidaha. Tad vidaha. Come to the whole verse through twice. Join in as you wish. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Idam shariram kanteya, kshetram itya bidiyate, 
इटाड्यो वेत्ति तम प्राउहु क्षित्रान्य इति तद्विद्धा श्री भगवान् वाच इदम् शरीरम् कांते या क्षेत्रम् इत्याभिदीयते इताद्यो वेत्ति तम् प्राउहु क्षेत्रान्य इति तद्विद्धा <laughs> so those are on, on, online, you can use that for practice. And we chat that at the beginning of every class, even though today we're kind of going to leap right into the Dzik Zisha, with the premise that we've already talked about. <clears throat> the Kshetra is the field of which I am aware of. And Krishna is saying to Arjuna, you are the Kshetranya. You are the one aware of the field the knower, the seer. The field is the scene, setting up the subject-object prakriya, teaching methodology. But what's significant about that? You are the knower, yeah. As Swamiji teaches us, what he says, Krishna is telling him, don't take yourself to be the object that is known to you. And don't let the attributes of the object that is known to you, the kshetram, the field, don't take that to be you. There's a yoga sutra that describes that phenomenon, taking that to be you. Anything come to mind? Vritti sarupyam itaratraha. The fourth. When the mind is not in hand, the nirodaha, right? Yoga sutras, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, having in hand the thoughts. The self abides in its own true nature. Tada drastuhu swarupya ashtanam. Swarupa, one's own nature. So when the self is not in its own true nature, when the vrittis are not contained, that's the next verse, what happens? Itaratraha, at other times. The vrittis, sarupya, they identify with that rupa, that form. Vritti sarupyam. Right? So the thought now has lived on to the object, the form. Not on its own swarupa. Those three verses. When the mind, nirodaha, is accomplished, we have the ability then to see the self in its own true nature. Swarupa vashtanam. At other times, the next verse says, Itaratraha, Vritti Sarupyam. The Vrittis leap on the object. Amazing connection, yes? We shouldn't be surprised. Because Patanjali, Atta Yoga Anushasanam, Anu, is what comes before. For instance, we say, The sun Bhati shines, like in that verse, Asti, Asti Bhati Priyam. Asti, Bhati, Priyam. The sun shines, Bhati. The moon, Anubhati, shines after. It has no light of its own. It's another way really to do Satyamitya. The only true light of the moon is coming from the sun. Right? It's a reflection. In that case, right. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to get, understand Mitya. It has no light of its own is the key. It has no Adishtana. There can be many Adishtanas, right? The moon's Brightness, Adhisthana, is the sun, is a, in the form of a reflection. Right. So hence, Atha Yoga Anushasanam, this is how Swamiji explained this Anu in this verse. Patanjali is pointing to all the texts that have come before and all the dialogues of, of the time. Right? And so, of course, these teachings get in there. So, and because a lot of us are in the Yoga Sutras, and now we have, there's an appreciation that I'm trying to do to set up that while we're talking about the Drig Drishya Viveka, we are learning about these verses of the other sutras.
because the seer seeing distinction is being presented. Does that make sense? So that's why I wanted to give that, that context. It's not to sort of just restate the sutras, but to unfold the meaning of those verses. That Swamiji says they have to be loaded. <laughs> there's links. There's links to Upanishad in this sentence. There's links to Bhagavad Gita. There's links to Kshetara, Kshetranya. There's links. You know, you don't see that in the verse. Right? So this, we have to have the lineage to, um, to give it to us. So, <clears throat> the Drik Drisha Viveka, I will post. We're just going to look at one verse, and hopefully I have copies to, yes. Give you guys. I would need to go get some notes. So you guys chant it among yourselves. See what you figure out. Where'd it go? And we'll be right back. markers on the other whiteboard up on your foot. Drig Drishya Viveka. Say Drig Drig Drishya Drishya Viveka. Viveka. Really important words in this title. Viveka in particular is key to the um, approach. In Vedanta, viveka is a discrimination, a discernment, applying our buddhi, our deduction, to evaluate. Drig, the seer, seeing, discrimination, or distinction. Drig, drishya, viveka. Drig, drishya, viveka. Seer, seeing, Discrimination. What? Well, clears it up. <laughs> you love what translations do, you know, absolutely nothing. So, um, <clears throat> let's chant the beginning. Rupam. Rupam. Drishyam. Drishyam. Lochanam. Lochanam. Drik. Drik. Manasam. Manasam. Yes. Tadrishyam. Tadrishyam. Drik tu. Drik tu. Manasam. Manasam. Rupam drishyam lochanam drik. Rupam drishyam lochanam drik. Rupam drishyam lochanam drik. Rupam drishyam lochanam drik. 
Rupa is form, and you see the same word in that um, <clears throat> Yoga Sutra, onto that form it leaps, Sarupyam. Right? The Vritti goes onto the form that it is seen. So Rupa is form. Pondering? Does something need to come out? Uh, what's the name? Nama. Thank you. Nama is name. Rupa is form. They are often, you know, we talk about the pot is name and form. <clears throat> so arguably, yes, when one is there, the other is implied. There's an interesting distinction, though, that over time, and really sometimes all we can, uh, forms dissipate, we have names with the names with the names with the names, really. It's really the name sometimes. Anyway, but the form, drishyam, <clears throat> is seen. By the lochanam, which is the eye, meaning the eye, the organ itself, Ooh. the organ of sight, the vinanendriya, right? Pretty obvious. And so what's great about this method is it starts with somebody that so far I think nobody's going to say, you know, I don't believe in that. And that's an important premise. This verse is also a Mahavakya. Because it resolves by the end of it the distinction between kshetra and kshetranya, between the vishya now, the seen object. The object is seen by the lochanam. The lochanam is the drik, the seer. So this first four words says the form is the seen, the eyeball is the seer. The form is the object. Lochanam drik is the seer, is the subject. The form is the kshetra, the field. Lochanam is the, ah, uh, maybe, knower is too heavy for lochanam. What does the eyeball know? Caught that one in time. It's just the sense organ. Interesting. Not just, but it is. Not the just part I was saying interesting. Yes, yes, it is a sense organ. And so therefore, its scope of function it's limited. includes certain things. Yeah. There's some one thing in particular that does not happen at the eyeball, but that is very strong with what the eyeball sees. Once the object is seen, Next, Tadrishyam, that seer, meaning the eyeball, is now seen by Manasam, Manas. The eyeball, thank you very much, the perceiver has now become the perceived. The subject has now become the object. The signal of the sight is received by manas. So it was previously that seer, tad drishyam, is now seen by manas. Manas, we understand the aspect of mind. This verse has a beautiful linking of how we understand manas and buddhi too. Does the eyeball like or not like what it sees? <laughs> we understand in, in the Bhagavad Gita, excuse me, just drop coconut water, urgent sacred book, please try it. And, um, sit down, Michelle. 
So the teaching of likes and dislikes are so at the heart of the Bhagavad Gita. You remember that from the teachings of? There was one time recently where I was teaching in a class and I made the statement that um, discomfort is sensation met with mental resistance. Mm -hmm. You've heard me say that in my asana classes. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that exploration when you go through various challenging discomforts of the body. Mm-hmm. And the conversation ensued, and it's always very interesting. And one point of view came up that, well, come on, that's just not right. I mean, some things are just comfortable, some things are just not. You know, it's just, it's not just in the head. But that was a misunderstanding of what I was saying, I realized. Because what this verse, for instance, is just talking about a thread that is a, a biological truth, if you will. The eye receives a signal. The eye has no preferential like or dislike. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in the Bhagavad Gita, what Swami Dayananda talks about in his book and the teachings of, and we'll look at this in all the verses, how we neutralize and navigate our likes and dislikes is at the heart, thank you, Janice, mm -hmm. is at the heart of um, the psychology of the Bhagavad Gita, how we navigate our... Because what happens... I wrote an article in chapter 15, uh, verse 2, about anger and desire, right? We, this will come up in our conversations. A like, I seek, I desire it. If it gets fulfilled, I'm okay. If it gets unfulfilled, then anger is on the other side of that, or jealousy or frustration. You follow? So the Bhagavad Gita talks about things like anger and jealousy as in Kama. They have no life of its own. Kama is the pleasure, the desire. Nothing wrong with the desire, but it's our sense of feeling less than we don't get it that is the issue. Often we have these conversations and people are like, as though you're stifling desire. No, 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 big misunderstanding. But why would I feel less than if it didn't go my way is the question. And also, do I think every desire I have should be fulfilled? <laughs> this is Viveka, discernment, come on. Right? So all this is in here. That relationship of, of manas is where then... It's tricky because there's buddhi too, but certainly the interplay between manas and buddhi, likes and dislikes. I would say that manas is the, the impulse of like. Buddhi comes in and says, do you follow this impulse? If you follow this impulse, it's very important to you, you really want it. You make a decision, I do it with dharma, or I do it adharma. That's buddhi. Manas said I want. So this verse helps explain that statement. Discomfort is merely sensation met with mental resistance. Object of perception is neutral. Where do we decide it is beautiful? Where do we decide it is not beautiful? The eye loves it all. The glory of Mithya equal until the manas. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this concept of neutralizing likes and dislikes comes up over and over again. When I was studying the Narada Bhakti Sutras in uh, Swamiji's ashram with Swami Tatwa Vedananda, summer 2011, I think, the polarity of beauty came up a lot. And that's what I see here, you know, while we respond to an object, he says, you invoke beauty, what do you have to do? You have to invoke ugly. Now, there's a difference between preference. You know, I like certain colors in my house. They make me feel comfortable. You understand? And that could be a physiological truth. There's that energy. You know what I mean? Preference, comfort, ease, we want that. In the language of the Vedanta, we distinguish preference from binding desires. Preference is harmless. Krishna likes to play the fruit. If he doesn't, he's not crying. But he likes it, so he does it. Understand? Preference is what I do, I enjoy. 
But if it leaves, I'm not less than. So binding desire means I've sarupyam. I've, that vritti has now, my meanness is attached to it. Those are the ones that are a problem. Understand? So we're not negation, sensual, any kinds of desires, pleasures, any of these things. But understand the process of how it becomes. Now, who is seeing this any experience that occurs? Right? You realize this is verse is talking about any experience that occurs, any relationship to the subject object. <clears throat> so now the manasam is the seer, right? And the, the object of, of sight has come in. And then Vrishya Divrit. Divritasya. We go deeper in. Who's the next subject? Who's watching the manas? The buddhi. So that D I divriti, you see that uh, divriti? I'm going to post this uh, online. Let's try this. The divriti. It's so funny. Can get it. It's all backwards. Too tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I'll post it. <laughs> like I'm in an MC Escher mirror or something. Hear me. It's actually nice to not have the writing. The tradition is oral. The next verse, Drishya. Di vritta yasakshi. Now, the buddhi, the thought modification, di vritya, sees the manas. Right? And who is the one that sees the buddhi? Now, what is buddhi there? In your direct experience, let's not take this hypothetically. You have the ability to say, I am sad. That is buddhi. The sad feeling is the manas. Hmm? Eyeball sees floor. Manas registers it as I've all seen brown patterns, whatever, you know, Manas registers as, as floor. Buddha has a thought, I am aware of the floor. That makes sense. It's the, the, the naming, the discerning, the, the, the observation. The, the Manas hasn't, it's just acknowledging the object. And there might be an emotive response. So who sees that buddhi, we're going deeper and deeper in. That one, drig eva, that sakshi, so this last word here, divritaya a sakshi, is seen by the, the sakshi, drig eva natu drishyate. It is one that cannot be seen meaning it cannot be objectified. There is no one for there to make it an object of perception behind the sakshi. The sakshi is you. When you say me, who's behind that aware of me? This is what they call the absurdity of infinite regression if you go there. It doesn't work. It can't, it can't go anywhere. There can't be another I looking at I looking at I looking at I. In this situation, in any situation, there's only one I. Let's not get ridiculous. But when you look at those examples, you talk about them and say, no, that can't work. So this verse, you see what it's doing. From the five elements world to conscious presence, to me. And naming all the steps along the way. <clears throat> and naming Natu Drishyate, the one who cannot be objectified, who cannot be seen. There is no other subject to see the subject. And that's why that, this verse closes the, um, 
that Mahavaki equation. We've went from seeing the body as a subject, which is beautiful because that's how we operate, right? We see here, body, and world there, there's me and them. And the boundary of me is this physical body, for the most part. Sometimes it's our house, our property, etc., our job, you know? You understand what I'm saying? We identify very strongly with the body as subject. Every sense organ that perceives, we call it a subject. And this is accurate, relative to the object. Right? Skin touches wall, we are engaging so we see this body as I, because it's the subject interacting with the material things through the five senses. All the five senses are subjects, perceiving objects. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, 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 it's not a silly error. <laughs> it happens very, and their patterns are ingrained. Right. So even when we get this aha, the body is an object just as objects in the world are, are objects in my meditation. I am equally unchanged in both. Did you realize that's what we did in meditation? Even though we might feel that, we might see that, you know, the patterns come back. Our senses have preferences. I may react in a certain way to get something I liked in a certain way. You know, all these things happen. That's part of the growing. You know, it doesn't diminish your knowing. You see the distinction between subject and object. You know, it's, it's an experience that you can have with this body. And I'm finding it's a very helpful experience to learn what the body needs. Chitran Chitranya. If you sarupyam, if you leap, if the clay starts saying, I am a small pot, you follow? The swarupa, the clay, has vritti sarupyam. It's attached itself to pot vritti, which is an object, sense perception. The pot is name and form. So clay has said, I am a small pot. So body becomes I. If body is I, who's there to listen to the body? I can't find anyone, can you? If I take the body to be I, how do I have anyone to listen to it? There is no subject object. Is this making sense? Well, it doesn't make sense, which I think is the point. True. <laughs> this aspect, I'm presenting a puzzle to reveal the, the, the value of seeing the body as an object. In order to, we say, listen to your body. We say these things, right? Mm -hmm. How can you listen to I? If you think the body is I, you can't listen to it. What? Are you, when you say the body is an object, are you including mind? Is you tell me. Part of the body? Yeah. You, you tell me. That's another branch. That's another object. It is another in object. My, in my head. It is another object for sure. Like I, I can see my body as an object much easier than I struggle with the mind as an object. So the mind, I would say, is is more for me the I attachment. And we'll look at that. And that's where we have in here. The is it the manas where your eye is landing on? Is it the booty where your mind is landing on? Right. Is it preferential things that it's landing on? So these things we explore over time. Very good. So in this case, um, really, idam shadidam is mind, body, senses, all inclusive. In the teaching and the meditation, I believe, so yes, thought as object of thought is the, thought is the kshetram. But we take thought to be the kshetranya. The mind thinks it's the, the knower, the kshetranya. There's ways to explore this. And this verse does it because it has us go beyond that mind that saw it and say, who is the one? The sakshi is the term witness, conscious presence, chaitanya, different terms, that can say, I see this. 
It's challenging. And this is why the Nidhyasa is important. You sit and you internalize these terms, these principles, and go through sense organs. You objectify your body in infinite ways. Literally. You could go to cellular. You could do the vayus. You could do the koshas. Each is a viveka. There's one of the Upanishads. There's a whole bunch of kosha viveka. If we can name different parts and disassemble it in, in whatever model you want, it's a beautiful meditation, then you are developing a relationship. I am the one aware of all this. And I am the one who can care for all this. What seems profound to me, unless the body is an object, we cannot listen to it. If you say listen to your body, you have to develop a subject-object relationship to it. You cannot be listening to I. Is this making sense now? It is, but it's still more difficult to think of the mind. I agree with you. I'm talking. This. I'm talking about the body as object yeah. and the implications of listening. I appreciate the mind question. We'll come back to that. Let's leave that right now. Good one. Hold it. Shada. You don't know Shraddha, remember? Daniel? Hey. No. <laughs> no. Shraddha. <laughs> not, not wrong, but not, not, not useful in this context. Shraddha is that trust in the teaching, in the method. And the Shraddha is, is, is when I have this question that is not answered now, I, we, we, we hold it. It's not gone. We will always come back to it, right? So it's that there's this thread. I trust we will get to it when it comes. So it keeps the mind engaged, even though my question didn't get answered. It took me a long time to learn how to listen to Swami Dainanda. Because I had the brain that wanted to, oh, 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 now tell me. And so I was learning to write down questions for the evening. And I started to learn, I'm going to sit back, because then I realized, he's going to get to it. Whatever came up in my head just now, I started to learn, listen, dude, just, just listen because he's going to get to it. I'm anticipating. You understand? So that's Shravana, the listening. He talks a lot about the grace of the listening. The tapaha, the will, to sit and listen is no small thing. The grace of the mumukshu, the student who shows up, who has the tapaha, the will to spend time, hour and a half, lecture, oh my God, so many other things you could be doing. <laughs> So I'm just saying they talk a lot about this, this the, the, the grace of the student and all that. And that, so it's important to recognize that because then when a question is passed on, it's, it's not out of any disrespect. And that shraddha is both the student saying, I trust we'll come back to it, I give it the benefit of the doubt, I don't get it now, but I keep listening. And then a lot of thing happens. And all these terms are on the website, that's why I'm pulling them out as needed. These are shraddha, uh, shravana, what we do, the listening. They're all called um, the practices, and some of them are the, um, the qualities or the attributes that will help a student succeed. It's different when you push back with questioning and wanting to understand the shraddha than if you push back with combative, right? So that, those explorations are different. Let me pause for a bit and, and regroup and see where I was. So a lot of the teachers do this in these methods. They have to sort of sit quietly for a while and figure things out and also boom. So um, the idea of listening to the body, in a way it sounds obvious. But if it were obvious, we would all be very at home in our sakshi, in our witness, in our atma. I think. It's, it's the mind to say, I know, I know, and then we realize how little it affects my real sense of myself. And what I'm saying with the experience that I've been dealing with the cancer and stuff, each organ system talks to me about its specific needs. And the idam sharidam, the, all, all along the time I've been studying this stuff, it lit up in a very different way. And when I realized I was really listening to the body, and it so wanted to be heard. It hit me. If the body is I, who's going to listen? Mm. 
We have to find the one listening. Testing is what you need. Long is what you need. Or is it, I want a piece of chocolate cake and I'm going to have a headache tomorrow, fuck it, I'm going to take some Advil anyway. <laughs> Where did that happen? In the tongue or in the manas? <laughs> What, do I do what I want or do I do what the body needs? Right. We're always facing these choices. But a lot of this is in this verse, developing that relationship. Subject to object creates a listener, a holder for the emotion. All the things that come up. You know, this started with a sense object, but to your point, okay, we can go to your question. Hmm. Ganesha. The, the, uh, it starts with an object of sense perception, but if we leap right to manas, an emotion is a manas object. Is this making sense to you? Mm -hmm. Sadness is an object of perception still. <clears throat> I am aware that I am sad. And therefore, when we work with our thoughts with the subject-object teaching, it can keep us from this point of view that whatever emotional state is here now, that I am that state, that somehow it's a defining quality to my personality. Yeah? We see that emotional states come and go all the time. I am the Sakshi, the conscious presence, the witness. But it's actually there all the time. I posted another video of the lamppost teaching we did a few weeks back here. You might want to go back and revisit that. You know, the lamppost is up there. and It's a great illumination thing that how does the light change no matter what goes on underneath? Eyeball is, 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 is tangible material, but conscious presence that receives it, right? At the end of all this, that, that sakshi, conscious presence, is not organic material. Right? So that, that one that receives it is, is ever-present, pervasive, changeless through all the changes in the body, changes in the moods. The moods are of the manas and the buddhi changing. I'm the one holding the space for whatever needs to happen as best I can. Meaning I, conscious presence. Carol, one of my teachers, talks about, you know, that, that witness in meditation you hold, that's, your, that's where healing happens. You know, so the thought is what? A wounded, unresolved developmental stuckness from who knows where. It's a trigger. It's an emotion that's uneasy. Whatever it is, a lot of the Jungian techniques and so forth that she talks about, you engage in dialogue about it. This verse explains how that dialogue happens. Who's dialoguing with whom? Does that make sense? You have a framework to sort of walk through and the one who is just holding the dialogue is seeing it all. And that one is the unconditional support, you know. It's talked about in the tradition, we all wish our parents were infallible. There's a certain age where we, we feel they are everything. We feel they are. their security, right? That young age. It's that age where we turn and we realize, you know, <clears throat> Mommy, there's a scorpion, get the scorpion. Mommy goes, Daddy, oh, Mommy's not infallible. <laughs> Daddy, house is on fire. Oh, Daddy calls the fire department. Hmm, somebody's more powerful than Daddy. <laughs> right? But there's that, that period where we keep looking for that infallible love. Unconditional, you know, all powerful. That sakshi is it. That witness is in you. And we link this to the understanding of Ishvara even more so. But this conscious presence that can hold the uptimes and the downtimes is this unwavering center. If it leaps, sarupyam, the vritti leaps onto the object, <clears throat> lost its center. In a very safe, gentle way in meditation, find that center with no threat in a relationship to the subject-object body. Develop a dialogue. You know? So then there's cases when you need it to hold a little crisis inside. It's a developed practice. Good, I'm gonna stop now and leave room for just 
and whatever. Hmm. It's a good verse. Can you just talk about that long word, the dictate? So, right, so what I didn't do, just to spare you Sanskrit grammar, the Sanskrit is compound words. And these words get strung together to help the chanting, and there's rules about how they come together. I'm not going to go into all that. But suffice to say that there are many different words in here, and that I can break up and show you. And in the interest of time, um, we'll do it briefly, but I will try to do that in writing. So, D, that D H I, this is the first verse of the Didik Disha Viveka. I'll read the, the second line that she's talking about. Drishya di vrittaya sakshi. So there's several words in there. Buddhi is the D. Vritti and sakshi. Sakshi is the word that means witness. That's the word that is the conscious presence could no longer be resolved. It is Atma. Right? The witness who cannot be seen, natu drishyate, cannot be seen, cannot, is not available to be objectified because there's no one behind it. Right? That sakshi is Satchitananda Atma. Does that answer your question, Janice? Yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll break these out. I'll break this on the, but we're not going to do the, the grammar, but just so you understand, yeah. Buddhi, Vritti, and Sakshi are the three words in there. And it's saying that those thoughts of the Vritti are now seen by the Sakshi. Eva. Eva is a sort of emphasis. Uh, and this one cannot be seen, meaning it is not available to be objectified by sense perception. There is no subject behind it. And then we get into the verses, then Krishna, uh, Arjuna then asks, okay, this is pretty far out, Kshetara, Kshetranya, knower, knower, all this stuff, but really, how does this affect my daily life? Arjuna asks, how would somebody walk, talk, eat, who knows all this stuff you say is so radical? I clearly don't get it. So what would such a person look like, Arjuna says. Right? And that's where we go into the next verses. We're going to see where we go with subject-object. We may go right into verse 7 next time. Aman et tuam, madam et tuam. This is in the value of values. So do be reading the value of values. Because we will pick it up. As a matter of fact, I'd like you guys to let's look at the first two chapters of Value of Values. I'll, let's, let's have the conversation based on that book next time. And if you're inclined, not necessary, write down a question. What would you like to talk about somewhere in the first two chapters of Value of Values? Can you pass me the book, Daniel? Where, do, where, where does it start the verses, not the first two chapters? Is the first two chapters still set up? Um, I don't recall because I'm don't further into the book, but I'll go back and start over again. Yeah, no, this is fine. Yeah, this is a lot good setup. Read as far as you want, but we'll talk. We'll start with the first two chapters. Okay, great. And then that verse goes into the qualities, the ethics, the dharma, amanitwam, madambitwam, ahimsa, shanti, accommodation, shtadiyam, forbearance, all these beautiful uh, uh, qualities of, that a mamukshu cultivates to help the mind neutralize likes and dislikes. It said that these values are necessary, in fact, for the mind to be able to receive the knowledge. In the beginning of the book, you'll see this little yeah. kind of syllogism. There's 20. 20 values. In yeah. In the beginning of the book, you'll see this beginning little syllogism that says, if these values are present, Brahma Vidya, one of the two teachings of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Vidya and Karma Yoga, right? If these values are present, self-knowledge, Brahma Vidya, may also be present. If these values are 
present Brahma Vidya self knowledge may be gained. And this is not as are absent, the way. This is what Swami Dayananda put in the beginning of this book. And I remember when I saw this, it has been a focus of mine. It's been a great thing to teach. I say this because this conversation is kind of up here, and like, whoa, cognitive thinking, where my consciousness is who's seeing eyeballs looking at what? The next part is very grounded in, in emotions, drives, those kamas, those purushartas, security, pleasure, dharma. It's a conversation about relationships, how we move in daily life. And like she said, there's 20 of them. We have to August to explore all these. Good. Any last words? Discomfort is sensation, Men mental resistance. Do you, would you say that holds true for emotional discomfort? Or are you just talking about physical? Well, understand the, the distinction about physical is not really subjective. It's true for all of us that the eyeball does not have a value judgment about what it sees. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So it's really just describing the path. That preference doesn't intrinsic in the object, nor is it the eye, it's the mind. Isn't that where emotion is? Well, but what's interesting though, what triggers the emotion? Is it not first some sense object? A memory could trigger it, but is it a memory of an experience that had a person there, that had people, that had good food, that had music, that had... I, I wonder. Because clearly the emotion, different than the object, the emotion is charged. It's not neutral. In the first example of the eyeball seeing a pen, that I don't like a black pen or something, has nothing to do with the neutrality of the information coming from the eyeball. By the time that's in motion, it's not neutral. So what I was trying to find is where did it get from non-neutral to, you understand? Yeah. Like is there a period in the emotions where there is a neutral situation, but I turned it into a sad one. I think we do do that. Yeah. That's, it's a good, it's, it's much more complicated. It's a different layer. That has to do with looking, identifying with the one who really needs not to have this thing go, it, it, the way, Anything goes, I would be the same as the cultivated state or time. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll come up. I'm sure there's some of the values in the, in the words that will lead us to this conversation. For sure. Hold that thread. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Dachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Nivava Shishate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om And thank you for listening. Wednesday, July 3.